Can you hear me at the back? Good, excellent. It was at one of the society's Christmas parties when Adrian James told me that in the archives there was a collection of photographs of castles taken by T. Lawrence. So, the next time that I was in, I asked to see them. They'd been given to the society some time ago by his younger brother, Professor Arnold Lawrence, a fellow of this society, <coughs> along with many of his own photographs. They were still in a couple of packets. <coughs> Those in the second packet were of a rather better quality, as I have subsequently found out they'd been printed for Lawrence's mother, Sarah, after his death. There are about 70 different images in all, and several duplicates of medieval architecture in France, with a couple of Jersey. Now, at first sight, they were not very significant. And to confuse things further, several of the prints turned out to be reversed. Oh, good. But when I started to put them into context with who had taken them and why, they seemed to be a collection worth investigating. So, under the guidance of Heather Rowland, who has been so instrumental in getting the society's collections unlocked, and with great assistance from the library staff, particularly Magda, we got them into archival sleeves, and with some very useful advice from fellows, I set about trying to catalogue them. During his childhood, Lawrence acquired a deep interest in medieval archaeology, and particularly castles. He explored <coughs> actively in England and Wales, in the summer of 1906, aged 18 and still at school, he made the first of his cycling tours in France, looking at castles and some churches, mostly in Normandy and Brittany. He did not have a camera then, so he bought, brought, bought postcards whenever he could. We have some of his postcards. They're mostly quite clear, and in some cases, they seem to have more architectural details in them than many modern postcards. He also recorded his impressions in some graphic letters home, which got published after his death. For a tour the following summer, he borrowed his father's camera, a plate camera, in which he might have been using sheet film. The camera was a Beck field camera, which was later given to the Museum of the History of Science at Oxford. They very kindly got it out of off-site storage for me to see recently. A field camera could be folded into a case, but the total weight was still over three and a half kilos. On top of that, he was carrying a tripod, but very little else in the way of a change of clothing. <laughs> there is an oddity that I can't reconcile. Most of our photographs appear to be contact prints, or look like it, but the camera plate size, or film size if you're using it, is slightly smaller than most of these prints. I welcome any discussion upstairs afterwards about that. To save film and time, he continued to buy postcards whenever he could. Whoops, I nice that. So that several of his photographs were just of architectural details. Now, these are some of examples from his 1907 tour, which is again in the north, in northern France. When he visited Chateau Gaillard, the castle that 
King Richard I built on the River Seine to defend his Normandy possessions. He wrote home that the, the castle was so magnificent and the postcards were so bad that he stayed there an extra day and took ten photographs. We have all ten of these, though some are not very good. These two are of the Great Tower. I don't think he ever again tried to take so many photographs at one site. He was very enthusiastic about Fougere and Brittany, placing it among the very best that he had seen. He had made a plan of it the previous year, while feasting on blackberries in the otherwise empty castle. Now he was able to take four quite good photographs, of which this is one. The print we have was a reverse view, which I've corrected here. And additionally to that, I have fiddled a bit with the contrast in some of these photographs. But of course, what you're seeing was all actually within the print. He had thoroughly explored the castle at La Hunday in 1906 and wrote a long description of it then, including how he had climbed along ledges in the dark towers, feeling for details. He took three photographs of it this time, two are here. But until now, they were mislabeled, even when published in a book of his letters. All his photographs of religious architecture are of interior details, often sculpture, in which he had a particular interest. He obviously couldn't resist photographing this holy water stoop in a church in Brittany. Um, I think he would make a marvellous chess man. In this easy digital age, it's sobering to think of the complexity of using a plate camera at that time. He wrote that he had spent three hours focusing on the rude screen in a church at La Baule, presumably in rather poor light. The result is one of his finest pictures. He went to Mont Saint-Michel, but he only took some photographs in the cloister. He wrote that he was horrified with the exterior. In the autumn of 1907, Lawrence began studying history at Oxford University. And by the following summer, he had decided to write a thesis based on his study of medieval castles. In order to gain extra material for this, his 1908 tour covered a considerable distance, cycling around France, from the north to the Mediterranean and back. He covered some 2,400 miles on a bicycle, which had an especially high top gear that had been made for him by Mr. Morris of Oxford. Three days before he started from Le Havre, the 1908 Tour de France had started from Paris. They only did 300 miles more than Lawrence. They had a day off between each of the 15 stages, and they went climbing around castles. As before, Lawrence was buying postcards whenever possible. But these are some of the photographs he took on that trip. Most were of castles, like this of the Great Tower at Tournau, east of Paris, which he thought ranked with Chateau Gaillard in importance for his thesis, in spite of the upper part having been rebuilt. As often elsewhere, he took pictures of some architectural details, which did not feature on the postcards. It's a bit difficult to decide which particular details interesting him. Sadly, his notebooks have not survived. 
Most of the photographs had pencil notes on the back saying what they were, which I assume were written later by armor dwellers. This one just said Bridge Pierce, really, presumably in France. By sheer good fortune, I was at a castle conference in France last year. On our last afternoon, walking around the town walls of Pont, one of my colleagues said, Bill, isn't that Lawrence's tower? And so it was. Later on, I found that Lawrence had described it in a letter. On the walls is a square tower turned inside out and cut in half. Not a bad description. In fact, it's an odd arrangement of two buttresses, but we don't know what sort of platform might have been on top. Although it was not relevant to his thesis, he did not pass by religious architecture if it was worth a visit, such as Vesele Abbey in Burgundy, which the guide books had told him was the grandest Norman church in Europe. He wrote home that he found this superb, but in sculpture rather than in proportions. The carvings were the finest early work he had met with until then. He went on to spend a night at the castle of Cuso, overlooking the Rhone Valley. He used three photographs there from his, in his thesis, comparing the castle with some crusader work that he later saw in the Levant. Then he commented that these walls were very thin. He had a great deal of praise for the fortified city of Carcassonne, southwest of France, but he bought some 40 postcards, most of which we have, and only took four photographs, one of which, that on the left, he said was the only pretty picture he had taken so far on that tour. He used it as the frontispiece for his thesis. He took a quite attractive photo of the gateway into the castle at Oldfort in the Dordogne, and wrote home that the butler had assured him I love that phrase. The butler had assured him that the castle had been burnt by the English in the time of Charles I and all was rebuilt in the 17th century. But Lawrence was convinced that the entry arrangements were earlier and included a rough plan of these in his thesis. One of the photographs was completely unidentified. So at the small exhibition we held upstairs in the library, I offered a bottle of the antiquary whiskey to the first fellow who could identify it. Appropriately, Dr. Bob Iron, the founder of the Castle Studies Group, told me it was Chalut, a bit north of the Dordogne. But I told him, we had a Lawrence's well, photograph of Chalut, and it was nothing like. Bob had visited the castle at Chalou in 1982, and it was from this castle that the crossbow bolt was fired, which mortally wounded King Richard I in 1199. And standing on the top of the tower on the left, it had been retopped since Lawrence's time, Bob had photographed a distant tower in the town, but did not have time to go there. That tower, however, fell down in 1994. Only a stump now remains, which made identification only possible by an internet search of old photographs. Our mystery castle was indeed a second castle at Chalou, a small castle built later in the town, Chalou Marlborough. Lawrence described the site briefly in a letter from there and seems to have taken both photographs from the rock on which he thought King Richard might have been standing to keep his feet dry <laughs> when the crossbow bolt was fired. Probably from a now vanished outer tower 
of the older castle on the left, Shalu Shango. Towards the end of his trip, Lawrence was amazed by sharp defeat. He had expected to have been ruined by restoration and thought he could do it before breakfast. He spent the whole day there. He bought all the twist cards he could and only took a few photographs of details. He thought that the small statuette of Philosophus, had it been of Greek marble, would have been, there would have been photographs of him in every album. He feared that his photograph of the price of the sound portal would not be worth looking at, though it certainly is. And his overall description of the cathedral, which he found the noblest building he had ever seen, is remarkable for a 20-year-old. Now, I've taken extracts from all of his letters and put them in a file which now live with the photographs up in the archives. To me, however, the most atmospheric photo was that taken halfway through this tour when he had reached Aigmont, the fortified town on the Mediterranean shore that the French king St. Louis used as a home base for his crusading fleet, and where the mosquitoes gave Lawrence his first bout of malaria. It's not a particularly good photograph, but it's very evocative, as this was where Lawrence first came to the Mediterranean, which he wrote home, was the way to the south and all the glorious east. And that, of course, was where life was taken. When he got back to Oxford, thinking that he had enough material for his thesis, a friend of the Ashmolean suggested it would be even more interesting if he could compare what he had seen in Europe with the early architecture of the Crusades. So in the summer of 1909, he did a strenuous walk in Lebanon and Syria, looking at castles. The resulting thesis, the influence of the Crusades on European military architecture at the end of the 12th century, helped him to earn a first class honours degree. Life then took him on to an archaeological deal in Syria, uh, an exploration of the Sinai, eventually by military intelligence in Cairo to the Arab Revolt. After his death, his thesis was published under the simple title of Crusader Castles, though it contains many of its images from France, for all of which we have copies in our collection. Other than in a handful of photographs, duplicates from other places. Our collection does not follow him in later life. But what we have from France, while perhaps not of great archaeological significance, helps to build a picture of the mind of a remarkable young man who, if events had not taken him in a very different direction, I've well become a distinguished archaeologist. Mr. President, I think it, it's a collection that has been well worth unlocking. And Heather, this one's for you. Thanks for all you've done. Thank you for listening.
about its history, as far as we can tell, and the conservation work that we've carried out. So first, um, just a little bit about what it actually is, um, in case anybody hasn't seen it. Uh, <coughs> basically, as you saw on the title slide, it's an engraved terrestrial globe. It also has 24 hours marked by Roman numerals around the equator on a moving ring, and that's connected with a brass strap to two other moving rings above and below the tropics. The lower cap is engraved, as you can see here, and uh, with a clock dial and the inscription showing that it was presented to the society by Benjamin Lewis Bullamy in 1850, and that was just four years before his death. Uh, the Bullamy family held the appointment of clockmakers to the crown for 112 years, from 1742 under Justin, until Benjamin Lewis's death in 1854. As I'm sure many of you know, the Bullamys are a famous and highly regarded family of clockmakers. So that's quite an important piece of provenance for this object. And within the globe is this clock, which drives the hands on the dial to indicate the time and also strikes the hours and the halves. The going train has got a verge escapement controlled by a sprung balance and the striking is controlled with a count wheel and it has this beautifully pierced and sculpted gate locking mechanism which you can see on the um, later point it's given up. Yeah, on the right there. And the craftsmanship on this clock really is fantastic. Every screw head is decoratively turned and every spring or cock foot is finely sculpted. Uh, the lead-off work to the outer rings is unfortunately mostly missing, but I'm going to talk more on that later. The, the clock was originally manufactured in France around 1690, and it's undergone a series of modifications and losses throughout its existence. Everything about its existence before Bullamy presented it to the society is completely unknown, other than what we can deduce from its materiality. So we don't know who made it, who it was made for, where it was before Bullamy had it, or indeed how it came to be in his possession. What we do know from Bullamy's notes that are held here in the collection is that the upper and lower portions of the map engraving were missing already by the time that he had it, and he replaced them with silvered copper, of course, including the inscription on the dial on the South Pole, which we just saw. A 1951 letter from the map room of the British Library, pictured here, suggests the engraved globe appears to have more in common with the maps of Pierre de Val from the final quarter of the 17th century, but an American cartography expect expert Barry Ridderman favours a map by Jaillot from 1691 as the source. The engraved map includes common cartography errors of the time, such as the Phantom St. Matthew Island and the duplicate New St. Helena, uh, longitudinally misplaced there. The features and basis of the map engraving, whether it's Jaillot or Deval, as well as certain features of the clock movement, uh, place its initial construction in France circa 1690 to 1700, so that's where we get the date from. Now, as I'm sure you all know, clocks need some sort of power source to drive the gear trains. And this is most commonly either weights hanging from a rope or a gut line, uh, or a mainspring in a barrel. However, in this instance, and this is one of the unique features of this clock, though it's not the only known example of this, the clock is powered by its own weight. A single chain is hooked and partially wound around the going train barrel just under here, and that loops over this pulley and which is mounted on this central rod and suspended from the outer frame. Crucially, the rod is not fixed to the clock. The chain goes over the pulley and then is wound round and hooked onto the other barrel for the striking train of gears. And remember that the clock is fixed to the inside of the globe case, uh, so that weighs about 10 kilos. So the entire clock and the case are essentially hanging on that pulley via the chain and their combined weight pulls down on the chain, causing it to be gradually unwound from the barrels, and that rotates the barrels and causes the whole globe to gradually descend down the central rod. And quite ingeniously, as the clock runs, these little spring barrels here uh, wound up so that when you come to wind it by lifting it back up the central shaft, the spring barrel then unwinds and takes up the slack on the chain, causing the chain to be rewound, because otherwise you would lift it and the chain would just flap around. Uh, so that's quite a clever way of dealing with that. The outer rings, here, here and here, these are the things that make this object truly unique. There's nothing else out there that works quite like this. 
Um, the, the rings, as you can see, are connected by the brass strap, and the case is constructed in four separate sections around the central cylinder, and the rings sit on top of their respective sections. So to give you an idea, this one here has got the top two sections taken off, and it looks top down, and this, so this is the middle ring looking from the top down, that ring there. And all of the rings have got roller wheels like these ones so that they can rotate around. This is the bottom ring, and you can see here that it's got a 366 tooth contract wheel um, going round the edge there. And that is how the drive is communicated to the rings. This drawing by Vullamy shows a small wheel on the clock here, that's a contrary wheel, and that meshes with an arbor here, and that arbor then has another wheel on the end which communicates the drive to this wheel. And because all the rings are connected, as that ring is driven, it takes the other ones round with it. Um, and unfortunately, this contrary wheel and this arbor, all of this lead-up work were lost at some point after 1850, we don't know when. Um, now, it starts to get a bit interesting. According to Bullamy's notes, the gearing arrangement results in the outer rings completing a full rotation in 24 hours, which kind of makes sense when you look at the um, chapter ring around it. Um, so let's just have a quick look at how that's driven. This is the motion work for the hands here, and a wheel behind that wheel, just there, meshes with this wheel just here, and that it's on an arbor which goes through the plates to the back to that pinion there which then engages with another pinion which engages with the contract wheel which then goes on to the rod and on to the outer wheel. Are you all lost? <laughs> because so, so are we. Um, <laughs> it's hard to follow and it's a very roundabout way of doing it. Um, that is all a bit kind of unnecessary and we'll see why. The, the contract wheel was mounted loose on a square on the end of the second wheel arbor, which we can see just here. So this arbor comes out of the plate and the contract wheel is mounted on that. Um, but it's not driven by that arbor, it's driven by all of that other stuff that I just showed you. Um, now that second wheel actually rotates once every four hours, which is six times a day. Uh, so a very quick and simple calculation can tell you that you can just mount a single wheel on there and have it connected with two wheels that are exactly the same size and the same uh, job is done. You get the outer ring rotating once in 24 hours. So you don't need any of this stuff coming off and back up through the plates. Um, it's, all, it's all completely unnecessary. And when you start to look closer at the surviving parts of the lead-off work, we see a distinct difference in tooth form on the wheels, style of arbors, and build quality. And you can see on this wheel there's burrs on the back of the wheel from when they were cut. You don't see that on the rest of the clock. And if we look closer at this second wheel arbor, um, where the contrary wheel is mounted, you can see there's a small step in the square there. Now that indicates that that's where the square originally stopped and the rest of it used to be round. And that's a fairly common forming clockwork which is used to mount any kind of motion work with a clutch spring behind it so you can adjust it from the outside such as so that you can move your hands around when the time goes forward or backwards for spring, uh, summer time, etc. Um, and this indicates to us that the outer rings were originally driven straight off that ar arbor as makes sense. Um, so all of the round the houses lead off work in Bullamy's drawings was added post manufacture. Um, and the closer we look to this object, the more signs of alteration and addition we see. I won't go into it all now because it does all get quite technical and it's, we've detailed it all in the reports that we've prepared. Uh, but the basic picture we've seen is that the clock in Bullamy's possession was different to the clock when it was made. And the clock now is different to how it was when it was in Bullamy's possession. Uh, it remains unclear as to why someone would go to the trouble of adding all of that extra work when their goal could be achieved in a much more economical way. And there seems to be only two possible explanations for why this solution was not recognised. Either the original lead-off work had been lost and whoever came to replace it had limited knowledge and understanding and didn't really 
realised that there was a simpler solution, or the clock was modified after manufacture to indicate a more simple uh, thing than it had previously done, and because the original function was much more complicated, they couldn't see the simple solution for what they wanted to achieve. Whichever explanation is the case, we don't know, it's clear that the second wheel and the 366 tooth contract wheel on the outer ring are the only really reliable sources of evidence for the ring's original function and manufacture because of how much else has been changed. There's also this star wheel and jumper mechanism in the equatorial ring, which gives some indication of a potential secondary function associated with the rings, but there are clear signs that this too has been modified. In its current configuration, it isn't geared in any way that seems possible to show any kind of astronomical phenomenon. Um, so all of that in mind, our best conjecture to, the, to date of the original functions of the rings is this. The three rings rotated once every 24 hours, were connected to each other by some form of strap or carriage, and that strap or carriage carried indication for the sun's declination. Um, I'm aware that this is probably a mixed audience, I, so I'm going to apologise. Probably there's two sets of people here, some who this is incredibly obvious to, and some who it's incredibly abstract to, so I'll try and get in the middle. Um, the declination of the sun is the angle between the equator and a line drawn from the centre of the air. So here's, here's the equator, we draw a line from the centre of the earth to the sun, and this is the angle, the declination. Um, this varies seasonally due to the tilt in the Earth's axis uh, that is caused by its orbit of the Sun not being perpendicular to the position of the poles. So when we're here, the Sun's declination is a negative angle, and when we're here, it's a positive angle. A declination indication on the globe would simply track that change in angle throughout the year. And Movement to some sort of declination indication could have been communicated from the star wheel and jumper mechanism in the central ring from a crank or cam mounted on this square shaft that protrudes here. That's connected to that wheel back there. Um, <coughs> the star wheel would require a single pin instead of the pinion that it's currently fixed to, which would engage with a 73 tooth wheel driving the square peg, resulting in it completing one full revolution in 365 days and that way the full range of declination angles throughout the year could be demonstrated. There's certainly space for the arrangement to fit, as well as signs that this area of the mechanism has been modified, but the actual configuration and nature of the original components is unclear. So all of this gets, it's a bit conjectural. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the materiality of this clock is really the only source of information that we have for its history pre bullamy um, and post bullamy as well for a, a large chunk of that period. So our conservation approach was definitely on the conservative side as befits an object of this singular rarity. The treatment goal was to stabilise the clock as a static object for display and make it safe for occasional, probably annual winding for special occasions like this one. Uh, this was also considered a rare opportunity to study and document the clock, so two extensive reports were prepared, one covering the history, function and conservation work and another more detailed, examining each individual component and describing its condition, relationship to other components, and signs of alteration or originality. One of our immediate conservation concerns were these spots of heavy corrosion. Localised pits of corrosion like this can sometimes be an indicator of the presence of particularly aggressive agents of corrosion, such as chlorides or sulphides, and we wanted to rule those out to make sure that our cleaning procedure was sufficient. So I took some samples of the corrosion and carried out FTIR analysis in order to identify the corrosion compounds. Whilst the infrared spectrum of the corrosion is fairly complex, many of the peaks were identifiable, and the corrosion products characterised as a complex mixture of copper and zinc hydroxides and hydroxycarbonates. <laughs> Neither chloride nor sulphide corrosion was indicated by the testing that we carried out. Spectra taken of the non-pitted areas of the plates were similar to that taken from the corrosion spots indicating that the spots are likely just extremely advanced stages of the general corrosion and tarnishing present on the rest of the plates. This is likely caused by pieces of hygroscopic dirt or dust causing localised differential corrosion cells leading to rapid degradation and pitting in these spots. So in short, we didn't need to do any specialised washing procedures or apply any corrosion inhibitors. Uh, we could just use standard clock conservation procedures. Um, so really the bulk of the conservation work was cleaning 
every component was cleaned manually by hand using inert solvents with medium brushes and bespoke scrapers made of wood or shell when necessary to remove dirt and corrosion. Another corrosion concern was this heavy acetate corrosion on the bell and bell nut. This is caused by the degradation of the leather spaces that are often fitted on bell mounts to prevent rattle and ensure a clean tone. It's not a particularly unstable corrosion as long as the source of the acetic acid, in this case the leather, is removed. The leather really was completely disintegrating anyway and needed replacing to get any function out of the bell. Uh, so I solved this problem by replacing it with plastazone, which is a conservation grade copolymer foam, which is acid free and inert. Additionally, it was noted that the shape of the bell hole was causing the bell to be insecurely seated, uh, so the rim was touching the bell stand and preventing it from sounding in a way that was in any way enjoyable. Um, which we addressed by placing a brass spacer in the gap between the bell and bell stand. And another area where things were flapping about quite a lot, and generally not doing what they were supposed to, was the hands. Uh, you can see here we've got a number of nuts and bolts that are trying to keep the hands in position, but they're not actually working. Uh, the minute hand should be fixed back here on a uh, sort of pentagon, and so the washers on this thread at the end that were there were just never going to work. Um, so the, the hand collet though, here, and this nut, we thought that they appeared to be quite historic and probably date from around Vulami's time. So we kept those, um, ret retained and removed separately the modern uh, nuts and washers, and uh, added a single spacer made of cast brass to do the job. Um, so that sorts of that out. There are also a lot of screws missing in the case. Most significantly, all of the screws for securing the upper middle section of the case to the central cylinder. Um, so they're like these ones here, which they have this long rectangular head so you can get some flies around them to undo. And they then have a short section of thread that screws into the cylinder and they terminate in a long tapered pin that locates into the holes in the outer case sections. And the ones that you can see in this picture are for the lower middle section, and you can see these empty holes around the upper middle section. All of the upper middle section ones were missing. Um, and you can see also at the bottom there's some different types of screws which hold the bottom section on, and a couple of those were missing as well. So these are all the various screws that I had to make to replace the missing ones to ensure that the object was stable, because remember that this whole thing is suspended in midair the whole time. Uh, so they're all made and finished by hand in order to match the aesthetic of the extant ones and the ones that were big enough to be were stamped to identify them as replacements. The threads were all cut using adjustable dies to match the existing threads in the globe, ensuring that all the treatment is completely removable, none of the historic material was damaged or altered. So what I'd like to end on is the last bit of work that we did, which was to record the operation of the globe in and out of the case and put a short video together, it's about a minute and a half that can be used to aid future interpretation. Because as we've said, the object is no longer intended to be permanently functional. And even if it was, you can't really see what it's doing inside the case. Um, so we made this video so that you can see what it's actually doing in there. Um, but first, I just want to acknowledge a few people who've significantly contributed to this project. And of course, to begin with, that is Malcolm, who is also here this evening at the back. And he was the lead conservator on this project as my tutor at West Dean. Um, society fellows Jonathan Betts and Michael Wright, neither of which are here this evening I don't think, um, but they both contributed extensively to the interpretation and unravelling of the outer ring mystery and offered a lot of helpful advice and comment on the preparation of the reports. Equally, West Dean College, where I'm currently a student and whose facilities were used for all the work, and Jessica Miller in the marketing department there who did the majority of the filming for the video you're about to see. Uh, also, you may have noticed that I've not really mentioned anything about the conservation or cleaning of the outer silver case, and that's because that was all done at Richard Rogers Conservation in February this year. That was a separate conservation project, so they also receive a mention. So now I will show you the video. Find it. So it's suspended here in a sort of temporary test stand that we made so that we could check that it was all functioning in situ and that's the clock inside the case there. So 
So this is the winding where it's lifted up the central rod, and you'll see now the, the chain rewinding around the, the barrels. And this is the escapement working, so this is the verge escapement. And you can hear that in the case when you go upstairs if you listen carefully with your ear right next to it. And it's, so it strikes the hearts, single blow every half hour. And then it comes around at the hours and strikes the hours as well. Quality French bell, very nice long sound. And that's it. Well, thank, thank you very much. And um, I want to thank John, Heather, and Danielle, um, and all the team here for making it possible for me to show you the new Lewis Award in this evening at extraordinarily short notice. And as I'm an addition to uh, the, the two excellent uh, talks we've just heard. I, I will be much briefer. Um, in my work at Sotheby's, it's not uncommon to answer inquiries about new discovery, Lewis Chester. Usually, my answer is a swift, short, but polite no. <laughs> um, and you can see here a representative group of the kind of uh, Lewis Chester we see. But last August, it was a bit different, and I thought it would be of interest for me to explain briefly how I approached the task of confirming my initial uh, very positive impression that here, unbelievably, it was the real thing. I was quoted in the press as saying my jaw dropped, and um, I'm not sure I said that exactly, but um, it, it was pretty impressive to see this. Once Yona had brought the water to Bond Street and I was able to have the water in my hand, in one sense, on the most basic level, it just felt right, the wear, the carving, the material. But it was essential for me to be 100% sure about the material in particular. This is an image of the inside, as you can see. Obviously, the majority of the Lewis Hoard is made of walrus ivory, with only three warders and two pawns, uh, which are made of sperm whale teeth. And so I asked Dr. Sonia O'Connor, fellow of the Society and a respected archaeological conservator, who had handled other pieces from the hall, to inspect that water and confirm that he is indeed walrus ivory. This was positive. So with the owner, we took the decision to do a radiocarbon dating test, which, as you know, is an invasive test and not something that one does lightly. The result was not exactly straightforward, since the first result gave a date range of 1328 to 1434, quite a bit later than the accepted dating uh, for the hall, which is to around 1200. However, when allowance for the maximum marine reservoir effect is taken into account, this extended the date range from 1283 to 1479, which is better, but it still raises questions. Perhaps as many questions about the veracity of the test as the date of its chest. Here's back in. Reviewing the literature on the hoard, I was struck by how few definite facts we know about the chestnut. The lack of hard facts about the new Lewis water did not now seem so unusual. Both the hoard and this water are first documented in Edinburgh, the hoard in 1831, and the water in 1964. Apart from notoriously unreliable and contradictory anecdotal accounts, nothing really is known for sure about the precise history of the board, or Edinburgh, before their Edinburgh debut. We don't know exactly where they were found, the board, or when, or by whom. But some pieces have been separated from the original board at some point before appearing in Edinburgh. It's certainly a possibility. So if we turn to our water, if one supposes 
but the board comprised four sets, and there would be four warders and one knight missing, as well as many, in fact, 45 boards. What becomes very apparent when one looks at the chessmen themselves, especially those in the British Museum, which obviously has the majority, it is that there is a huge variety in the size and style of the chessmen. This is an image from Dalton's catalogue in the British Museum um, uh, group. And this is not that they have a variety. It's not a new observation. And I just point out, um, in particular, the difference in the heights is quite extraordinary, um, from ones which are around 7 centimetres to those which are over 10 centimetres. And I think here you can see quite clearly the quality of the carving of a king like this is, is very different to a more successful, if you like, it, hand um, of the king on the right. Um, but above all, I want you to take on board the differences between them. And it's the analysis of these differences that have resulted in the board being divided into these four sets, dependent on their size and, I think, to some extent, their quality. The missing warders are lacking from the largest set and from the smallest set. Our order fits into the largest set. So far, so good. But what about the C14 test? Frustratingly, it is a test without context, because none of the other pieces from the board have been tested. Perhaps the test is not sophisticated enough. Perhaps we need to consider the possibility that the chessmen represent an archaicizing style of the late 13th century in Norway. We may have to wait for an answer until one of the other pieces from the board is tested, which I suspect is not going to be any time soon. So, I returned to look closely at the new Lewis border. I was encouraged by one important feature that all my research included is unique in chess pieces to the Lewis board. This is the fine network of channels which run across um, the whole surface um, and that of every piece in the hall and as you see it here. Um, this is one of the warders from the National Museum of Scotland. Um, and you can, you can notice that our <coughs> warder clearly appears darker. Um, and this is because the channels are filled with dirt. Um, you can, I don't know how big the slide is, but it, it's quite clear that I have. But they are nevertheless, to my eye, pretty much identical. The chances of these marks appearing on a chess piece that looks, as you see here, exactly like the Lewis chessman and not being part of the board is, I believe, highly remote. Word about the colour of the New Year's Warden. And you will, be you will be able to see the varied uh, dark brown, it looks a bit, a bit orange here in, in, in this slide. Um, but this very dark brown colour, better than we go upstairs. Clearly, this is quite different from the modern appearance of the existing hall, and uh, I'll leave him on the screen um, from Edinburgh. But we must remember that this is a modern appearance. In 1832, Frederick Madden noted a red or beaty colour on some of the pieces. Nothing of that remains. Tests at the National Museum of Scotland have detected mercury and sulphur in some of the Scottish pieces, probably from traces of cinema, from which they have concluded that some of them may have been coloured with red vermilion. In 1909, when Dalton published his catalogue, which I've mentioned, of the British Museum libraries, this image shows that um, several pieces were then quite a different colour from today. And I put those two, you can see the British Museum number 16 and 120 um, from the door from 1909 uh, uh, image which I just showed you, and the respective um, BM116 and uh, BM120 on the right, which shows that then the colour was quite a bit different from today. These images perhaps exaggerate the differences, but my interpretation is that our warder had he appeared 110 years ago, um, would have looked a bit less different from the horde than he does today. 
Also, the British Museum's scientific report, conducted around 1997, noted areas of green on some of their pieces. The possibility that some of the board was originally green could be supported by the green area on the back of our wall. And we are, you'll see that when you go upstairs. It's actually at the back, just behind the, um, the shield, which is here. Um, and we're continuing to examine this substance. Whilst I was researching the new Lewis Warder, one expert observed to me that our piece is unusual because the chessmen from the Horde are generally in good condition and the extent of damage on the Warder, notably the loss of the left eye um, and the right hand, set it apart. Um, this image, which I trade I took from the National Museum of Scotland, um, of the, the night in Edinburgh demonstrates that there are certainly comparable areas of damage on the chessmen. And um, the previous slide here as well, you see quite extensive damage in um, some of those, the, the sword um, also quite damaged here. Satisfied the material, the C14, and the state of preservation of the water are close enough to the Lewis Hall for the shared history. I turn to a closer stylistic analysis of the water group. Now, this is published in some detail in our catalogue uh, for the auction, which is happening on the 2nd of July, and I've got some off-prints of this upstairs for you to see. So, suffice it to mention here that um, what is striking about the Lewis Chessmen um, is that they are all very different. And I illustrate a group, again from Dalton, um, of the, the knights and um, I think it's fascinating to see how um, different every shield is um, the, the design here actually this one this is very similar to the design on um, our water if that's that next. yes here so a circular <laughs> lot in between the, the two verticals but here with a decoration um, in between running up and down. Um, but uh, Neil Stratford, who I see here tonight, um, in his book clip, the Night Hunter book clip on the British Museum, um, chess pieces, um, illustrated that diagrammatically all the shields, of the knights and the wards, and there's not one that is the second part from the ones which are only decoration. So um, what really struck me is that they're all different. They all share similarities, but they're all different. And I think that our new water shares these affinities and these different, which are inherent certainly within the water group. Now, um, I'm, I'm very conscious that um, we have uh, refreshments waiting, um, and I'm sure you're, you're all keen to, to, to go and um, have something to drink. And I think I've spoken enough, and I hope that um, you would have some questions which I can answer um, and perhaps on the falling ball clock upstairs uh, we can take some questions on that um, up in the library. Um, so I think that concludes what I um, want to say and I hope you'll enjoy seeing the water upstairs and available for questions.